Yeah, my name is, as I said, it's Francis Malloy. I, I'm an MP. But it was not an MP in the normal way of things is that we don't take our seats in Westminster. So we don't take our seats in, in the House of Commons. Uh, we're elected. Uh, we do basically everything else in the same way as other MPs. Uh, we run a constituency service. We provide that service in uh, three of our advice centres and other meetings that will come out of that. But by and large, Sinn Féin is a party that is abstentionism from Westminster. That started off back in 1918, whenever we were looking for an independence for Ireland, and they decided to, to abstract ourselves from Westminster and to set up an Irish parliament. The British government at that time didn't recognise the vote of the Irish people for reunification, and uh, we were left then with partition. And partition is the issue that comes back to haunt us now with Brexit, because it's partition and the border that actually we will be dealing with today. And one of the things that, that people may not be aware of is that Ireland will be the frontier of European borders. So we'll have one part of Ireland within the European Union and the northern part of it outside of the European Union. So that's where the whole issue of a land border will come in, different entirely to, to most other situations, and two different countries, and a disputed border even at the best of times. So just to start, we most of you will be aware of the referendum result, and back in the 23rd of June, the majority of people in the North, 56% of them voted to remain in the European Union. And uh, within the six counties, what makes up Northern Ireland, the 56% uh, voted to remain. And following on from that there in October then, the Assembly itself actually voted to remain within the European single market. So the Assembly itself right across the board of the political parties that were there, and there's very little agreement in the Assembly between the political parties of unionism and nationalism. There's very little that they agree on. But on this issue, they did agree on that. And primarily agreed on it because of the economics of Ireland and how it's affected. Small country to start off with, and trade north and south is a big factor. The majority of people in the north export anything they make or grow, either to the south or to England or to across the world in various different ways. The, uh, but the re reality on the 23rd of June was that 11 out of those 18 constituencies, 18 constituencies in the north, and 11 of those voted to remain. And so what we have been saying all along is that vote needs to be respected, that the British government need to respect it, because it's, it's not like saying, well, Wales and Scotland and England, uh, it, because that's all seen as one mass land. The north of Ireland is separate. It's a different situation completely. It's governed in a different way. Everything outside of that there is uh, done by consensus. And one of so the issues that... In relation to a hard border, for instance, it's very difficult. Even in the times of the Troubles, the British government found it impossible to actually secure a border across <coughs> that 300 mile right across from Derry right round to Newry. And there are several hundred crossing points. In fact, every field is a crossing point of that border. And, and even recently, you know, are now finding that farmers who are employing new communities coming in to work on the farms, and because they own a farm in the southern side as well, that those people are traveling from north, south, and south to the north in walking in fields. And one field is the same as the other, no matter where you go with it. And those people are now being either arrested by the police in the north for not having identification documents, or they've been arrested by people, guards in the south, for not having their identification documents. So, already we are seeing the difficulties around the, uh, the, the Brexit and how that will affect, and that's without it even being in place yet. Because it is a frontier, it's the one frontier that you will have directly with Europe, and it's the one frontier which some sort of structure will have to be in place if the European Union is going to have its borders protected, and if the British government is going to fulfill the promises it made to people before the referendum in relation to immigration. So all of that is part and parcel of 
the decisions that are being made at the present time. But what we can't have in the future is one part of Ireland in Europe and the other part of Ireland in the north out of Europe because the problems that we're like to can, can contain within it. The other big danger is the British government's attitude to the whole issue of the European Human Rights Act. And that has been an issue that they were taking up even before Brexit, but certainly something which actually we would fear would actually happen uh, in the new situation. Because a lot of the Good Friday Agreement, again, on their rights and equality are tied into the European uh, Human Rights Act. And whilst it doesn't directly mean that they're outside of that uh, right away, but the desire to dismantle the protections that are within that by the British government would lend us to fear what might actually happen. So prisoners, equality issues, rights, all of that will come into that if we're into a situation of facing that Brexit. Increasingly it is clear the British government neither have a plan for after Brexit or a plan for how it's going to be implemented in relation to Ireland. It's a bit like a lot of the other issues that they have done that forgot about the frontier that they actually have with another country as they see it in legislative ways. And so we had, for instance, the tax that actually was on HTV vehicles and a vehicle going north and south at the present time has to pay a tax even at this time, even within European Union countries. We also have the issue of the quarry tax which the British government forgot about completely how it would affect the uh, quarries north and south. So you have materials being shipped back and forth and the tax has been collected on that or not collected within that as well. But So they have no plan really how to deal with a border because they don't remember all the time that they have a border within that situation. And as my colleague John O'Dowd said recently, it's a bit like the programme of the Yes Minister but not as funny because it's going to be dealing directly with people on the ground and that's where the most difficult will be. So ultimately any decision concerning the future of the people of Ireland should be taken by the people of Ireland. And you know, the Irish Proclamation of 1916 talked about the unfettered control of Irish destiny. And unfortunately what's happening at the present time is the control and the decisions have been taken by everyone else except by the Irish people in that situation. We do not trust the British government to actually negotiate on our behalf because we believe that the British government will, in its own interest, look after its own situation and that's to be taken for granted. And we are not also that overly protective of the Irish government that they actually might look after the entire island of Ireland but actually more interested in how the 26 counties will be affected in relation to Brexit. And that brings us into the situation of how do we actually bring about the change that's nasty with happening. And you know, the British ministers keep saying Brexit is Brexit, but have failed to explain what is Brexit at the finish of. So we don't know what it is. I don't think they know what it is. And certainly the British Secretary of State, James Brokenshire, doesn't know what it is. Uh, in relation to how it's going to happen and what's going to actually happen. He will say he doesn't want to return to the borders of the past. Borders of the past were a number of different st stages. Because first of all, you had a custom border, which I remember well being a place where people actually had to be searched and taken off trains, buses and all the rest to be searched when you're going north or south because of, at that time, they were smuggling butter or tea or sugar. Uh, and in later years uh, of what else they might have been smuggling. So all the different factors come into it of what type. Then you had a security border, which was basically just the protection uh, of British interests within the island of Ireland and the north of Ireland. Uh, and security basically put there to try and keep the unionist community at bay that their interests were being protected and, and not in the interest of all the people of Ireland within that. So the best way that, that we believe that we can achieve a normal situation <coughs> is by the North remaining with special status within the European Union. And that can come in a number of different ways. One is that you can have the free flow of people back and forth and the free flow of goods. But 
to also how you actually change the attitude within the British government towards the people of the North. Because they have been forgotten about in this situation as regards what their future lies. The Irish government has been expected to police the, uh, the borders on behalf of Britain, try to protect them from the people who are travelling in and out of Britain. Uh, and they also will have to then look after Irish citizens and European citizens that are within the 26 countries uh, of the Irish Republic. So the only way to guarantee any normality within that situation is that the North stay within the European Union. So that North and South will still be within the same tax system, the same custom system, and within the same structure that's there at the present time. And all of this has brought it on to a new decision making where how do, you, how do you actually make that happen? British are saying it can't happen. Brokenshire, the Secretary of State, is saying no, it's not possible. The uh, Irish government are saying they're actually not getting a favourable response from Europe in relation to that it has to be one or the other. Uh, and no one is really thinking outside the box as regards how you do that, how you get that the North could remain within Europe uh, and within uh, British structure, or do you have to then put it into an all Ireland structure? And that brings us back into the situation of looking at a new Ireland, uh, an Ireland beyond partition. Because when you come back to this, the problem has been partition. And you know, if you look at any country around the world where this has happened, partition, it hasn't been a good solution, and it hasn't served the people well. It has divided them in order to conquer them, and it has left uh, on steady, uh, unsafe governments in the, the past. And Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is a very similar situation. So we need to then open up the opportunities of what and how the North could remain within the European Union. And that comes back to, again, the Irish having the unification of the country, at least having the recognition at this point in time that the Irish would like to be the European aspect of that there and the special status for the North. It wasn't so much an anti. Sinn Féin would have been very anti-European Union some years back uh, and we replaced ourselves in that situation of having a very critical engagement with Europe North and South. Uh, but in the, in the North particularly, we would have been arguing very strongly that the European uh, intervention within that whole thing has been very effective in stabilising the peace process but also stabilising the industry because one of the things that the north when it has been developed it was all in the east you know the greater Belfast area we term it as east and west of the Ban because the Ban river runs down the middle of it and really under the old Stormont and on the British direct rule there was no investment west of the Ban and, and so nationalists who normally live in the west of the Ban didn't benefit from all of that on the European Union there was a better dispersal of the funding and the resources that were in that. And we were able to develop the infrastructure west of the band and try and create a better structure there within it. So we have been critical both of it and would remain critical of the European Union on the mechanism that they use and the structures. And like we would be opposed to the European army idea, the European, like one of the things, we don't want to step out of one colonial system of an end British rule in that country and to step into a new colonial system of bringing in the European Union to be the big brother on top of us. So we want to see a more critical engagement. We want the Irish government to be a national government and have its own uh, policies and not be dictated from, from Europe within that. So it's a more critical engagement in Europe in general. The only thing that Theresa May had done was whenever she was over campaigning before Brexit, she actually told us you're going to have, if you if you don't vote to, to remain in Europe, you're going to have a, a hard border here, you're going to have checkpoints and custom posts and all the rest of it. And now she's actually saying, well, not necessary. But then she changed the position in between that. Uh, so, but in relation to involvement or part of the negotiations, one is that James Brokenshire doesn't even have a place in those negotiations. He's one of the people who are consulted, but no input into it. And the executive in the North, whenever it was up and running and Martin and, and Arlene were attending those meetings, they were basically there just in uh, a hearing capacity. 
they had no input into <coughs> how. Now they, they tried to input into it, but the British government didn't listen within their situation at all as regard. And as Martin said himself, one is they had no strategy and they wouldn't allow the executive to form part of trying to build a strategy within that situation. So it was, it was kind of productive in both ways. So there would have never been a team no. from Northern Ireland being part of the national Brexit team that negotiates with the No, EU. no. They, they were insisting, and the same I think with Scotland and Wales, they were insisting while they were there to be consulted with, they were, weren't part of the team that would be negotiating. The British government as a sovereign parliament would negotiate for at all. Uh, and no, no input, and no recognition of the devolved administrations that they had been part of setting up in the first place. So, you know, it, it, it undermined the devolved administration. In relation to the, the special status, in relation to the North, uh, as regard to Europe, everything about the North is special status. You know, we have special peace program of funding from Europe to actually uh, cement the peace process. We have a special rural program, which is different to the rural program that you'd have here. It's not just about agriculture, it's about rural development, about rural infrastructure, it's about building the infrastructure across the rural community. That was set up. The two main funding uh, streams that we would have in the north are peace and rural. Those are the two main. So that was special status already. We also then had a special status for the border counties, where the six counties in the north and the nine counties around the border were, were linked together on the special European programme body.